Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Amber Rose to talk about um, some of the work that she's been doing. And I guess, you know, it's kind of interesting managing a YouTube channel as I'm about to enter a religious order. So I remember, Amber, we were scheduled for, I think, in July. And then yeah. things got kind of crazy with my schedule. We had to figure things out. And then, you know, on the whims, we figured today would be a good day. And so I, I really, <laughs> I appreciate, you know, just your, you know, your flexibility and all this. And uh, of course, yeah. I guess I'll have you begin by introducing yourself um, okay. and especially even um, your own little, um, I, I, I know you have an Instagram platform called mm -hmm. The Religious Hippie, but do you, is that like a wider podcast? Like, tell me more about that. Yeah, so um, I'm Amber Rose, The Religious Hippie, most people know me as, and my uh, social media, I have a podcast, it's called A Catholic's Perspective with The Religious Hippie. Um, obviously we talk about Catholic and pro-life uh, topics on that podcast. Um, and then we actually just wrapped up season two in the last couple months. I think the last episode's coming out in July. Um, and then from there, I do have Instagram. I'm the religious hippie on Instagram. I have a Facebook group for Catholics who are trying to find like-minded Catholics. I have a YouTube channel. I have a Twitter. Um, I tweet a lot. <laughs> so if you don't like getting spammed by tweets, uh, maybe don't follow me on there. Um, and besides that, yeah, I'm just kind of all over social media. As for background, um, I'm the youngest of a family of four. I live with my parents still near Chicago, and I was raised in the traditional Latin mass from a very young age. When I was about 11 or 12, we fell away from the faith because of the sex scandals that were going on in the church at the time. And it impacted a lot of families, millions of families, but uh, ours was one of them. And so because of that, we stopped going to church. And then when I was around 17 or 18, I had my conversion where I was uh, struggling with mental illness quite a lot. And I woke up on a Sunday morning and I remembered going to church as a young, a young child. And I, I wanted to do that again. So I went to church and I had a major conversion in front of the Eucharist and I've been back ever since. And I also just wanted to highlight too, I just, you know, I really appreciate having you know, you know, just like strong, intelligent, conservative women on my channel. Cause yeah. I had previously, I had um, Olivia Rogers on and she was oh, the woman who actually invited me to my very first mass. And Wonderful. so it's like, you know, I want to give, you know, all of you a shout out. So um, I guess one, one interesting question is this, you know, I remember I was on Facebook and I saw, you know, you know, your name and I think the picture, you know, Facebook was suggesting you, cause I guess we have mutual friends and it was a picture of you like with a pro-life poster you know, you're holding up on a highway or something like that. And then you also had the tag or the, the sticker, like the Latin mass matters or something like that. Yeah. And at first, you know, I didn't, I didn't send a friend request immediately. Cause I was like, Oh, she seems like a legit person, but I don't, you know, know her yet. And then I think I ran across some of your content and I saw you were the religious hippie. And I'm like, wait, this super conservative girl that I know yeah. being called a hippie, you know, yeah. like, I was like, what, what was going on there? So can you tell me more about like, what, where the name religious hippie come from? Yeah, I get this asked like all the time and I'm just like, I feel like I put it in every video at this point. I feel like you guys should know. But the truth is, is that I probably should put a disclaimer in front of like all my videos. <laughs> the whole the whole reason it started was because when I was younger, um, when I was in my teens and I was away from my faith, I dressed like a hippie. Like I just, I genuinely looked like a hippie. I have gypsy genetics. Um, I loved like the long skirts and the crazy the crazy tie-dye stuff. I don't know. It was so bad. Um, <laughs> but my friends nicknamed me hippie. They were just like, oh, hey, hippie. Like, hey, what's up? You know? And then when I came back into my faith, those same people were like, well, you know, I, I guess you're like the religious hippie now. And I was mm. like, we're going to stick with that. Um, so when I started up my social media platforms, I wasn't really sure what to call it yet. And so religious hippie was supposed to be more of like an in-between name until I find like what I really, really wanted to call it. Um, but then over time, I realized that the religious hippie, the title brings people in from all different types of backgrounds, ethnicities, religions, um, because I noticed a lot of people tend to be turned away from the word Catholic. Uh, they already have their misconceptions about the word, about what it means to be a Catholic. And so they don't, they don't take a chance to watch a video about Catholicism because the name is simply in it. Whereas the religious hippie, I talk about Catholic stuff because I am Catholic and I am pro-life and things, but I'm more likely to draw in an audience from other religions and things than just uh, Catholics. And when you said you were away from the faith, 
um, you know, during this kind of hippie phase, right? I don't know if you've retained any of your hippie, you know, oh, quirks or anything like did. that. Okay, cool. Um, were you were you non-religious or were you maybe Protestant? Like, what, what do you mean by away from the faith? I honestly can't really tell you what I was. Because okay. <laughs> I definitely knew God existed, mm -hmm. but he was just like at, in the back of my mind. Like, I didn't really care. Um, but every now and then we would go to like, church for you know Easter or a holiday or there would be some event with the group I was with that was Catholic because I was still a part of some Catholic groups um but I never I don't really know how to explain it I, I was probably like lapsed you know like yeah. more of like a lapsed Catholic and then you know obviously then you, you would identify yourself as kind of like a revert you know somebody who came back to the faith and yeah. so what exactly kind of prompted that 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 movement you know, in your, in your belief? I think a lot of it was, I didn't have a support structure. Mm. Um, and Catholicism really offered that support. I had that support when I was a kid, because, uh, obviously we followed the Catholic church. Um, and so through that, I had that support structure growing up. Um, but in my high school years, because we left the faith, I no longer had that support structure. So I kind of just did whatever I wanted. I, I mean, I was, I still had a moral compass, so to speak. So I never did drugs. I never got drunk. I never had sex out of, out of, outside of marriage and I'm not married. So, duh. um, but I don't know. I, I just, I don't know how to explain it really. It, it was mm -hmm. more like I didn't have the structure because I didn't have the structure. It landed me in a lot of mental health issues. And then remembering the structure I had back when I was a kid and wanting that foundation again, that foundation of faith and being sure of like an afterlife and being sure of all these things um, was really important to me. And so I did a lot of research into Catholicism and I started actually praying my rosary uh, and, and doing those things. And I realized like, this is truth, like this is it. Um, and I researched other religions too, because I didn't want to be like, oh, the end all be all, you know, like I want to <laughs> see what options are. And none of them were really like foundationally solid. They all had something wrong with them that kind of was like, well, Protestantism keeps splintering. Orthodox don't believe in a hierarchy. So there's just chaos when it comes to, you know, like, well, they don't believe in the Pope. So there's like chaos when it comes to um, like leadership in certain areas. So <laughs> I really clung on to Catholicism because it was the religion I was raised with, but also because it was true. Yeah, it just made more sense. You because you were really attracted to order then. Mm -hmm. Like if we could put just a nutshell on it. Right. Okay, that's that's very fascinating. So, and I've seen now that you've um, you know, obviously with your with if we can call it a ministry, right? You, it's not just bound to like being online and you know making tweets and Instagram posts and right. you know, it's actually I've seen you actually go around to different parishes and and give talks. So what's yeah. that been like to kind of share your story, um, you know, in, in front of other people? It's scary. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest with you. It's horrifying because most of the people I've shared my story with are people around my age, probably yeah. more like younger. Um, I've shared it with teenagers. I've shared it with eighth graders. I've shared it with like 19 year olds, a big wide spectrum. And I have a lot of like parents that also sit in on the talks that absolutely love it and come to me mm -hmm. for advice. And I'm like, <laughs> This is amazing, but it's horrifying being this out there with people, this vulnerable, because I'm a very private person in general. I always have been, even like before I came back into my faith. And even though I know it's important and this is what God's calling me to, it can still be very hard when you get those people who attack you and attack your own journey and attack your relationship with Christ, because maybe they're going through something themselves. Again, haters will be prayed for. That's what's my own little slogan. <laughs> um, but I find it to be very, very scary at first because uh, you don't know who's listening, but then the other side of that is you don't know who's listening, you know, like there might be somebody in there that might look bored, but then later they take it home with them. They sit with it for a while and they're like, wow, I can really apply this to my life. Or I have some young adults who come up to me afterwards and they're like, what you said about this, like this really spoke to me. Like, this is what I'm going through right now. Um, do you have any advice for like certain things? Um, I think the Q and A sessions are probably my favorite though, because that's really when they get to ask me, you know, specific questions that regard to what their situation is, but I've been through something similar. I don't know if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I mean, how, how do you feel um, if somebody called you like a Catholic influencer? Do you like that or do you accept it? Or, or what, what are your thoughts about that? Title? See, my producer and I fight about this all the time because I'm like, <laughs> well, technically I am a Catholic influencer. And he's just like, yeah, but it sounds trashy. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> because when you think of an influencer, you think yeah. of like this white girl with like overpriced scrunchies and mm -hmm. like, you know, horribly made products. Um, you don't think of like a Catholic person spreading faith and so there's kind of like again misconceptions about the word influencer which I'm like technically I am but we call myself like a communicator for Catholicism is mm -hmm. technically what we call me but yeah Catholic. communicator for Catholicism I kind of like that so <laughs> here are my last two questions right so obviously I want to talk about you know your pro-life kind of I mean you're very vocally pro-life and that's awesome to see Thank you. um you're not ashamed of it and, you know, it's really awesome to see like women in the pro-life movement because people often have the stereotype, you know, it's just guys, you know, old white men, what have you. Um, and then obviously we're going to talk about Latin mass as well. But first, you know, um, I guess let me ask you, why are you pro-life? And let me maybe make it more spicy and be like, well, isn't that anti-woman? Ooh, spiciness <laughs> has, has, yeah. So, <laughs> oh gosh. So I was raised pro-life. When we obviously, because my mom is very pro life. Um, so she would raise me and my sister. She would take us to abortion clinics. We would pray outside of them with other people. We were very involved in the pro life movement. We would always make um, care boxes for crisis pregnancy centers. Uh, very involved. And because I was around big Catholic families, um, my friends were big Catholic families. I, I knew where babies came from. Like I knew, like, I knew all of that stuff. And so automatically to me, abortion was already wrong because morally we know it's wrong like we know like that is a that's a baby like there's no way that's not a baby you know mm -hmm. um so morally it just i mean morally but also just like um in the back of our minds we just know it you know and so i was raised pro life i never wavered on those views though i never really stood up for them once i was in high school because i didn't really know much about the abortion industry. I didn't really know much about the pro-life side of things. All I knew was that abortion was bad because it ended a human life, mm -hmm. um, which I suppose is all you really need to know <laughs> to be pro-life. Um, but for it being anti-woman, I get that so often by people who just misunderstand what we represent. And we aren't just trying to push for the child to be born. We actually have centers to care for the baby afterwards and the mother. Mm -hmm. There have been multiple um, examples of this where pro-life agencies have actually bought a mom a car because they were like, what is preventing you from having this child? And she's like, I don't have a car to get to and from work. And they're like, we will pay it for you and we will pay for your gas. And they set up these deals with their mom, with the moms so that they are able to care for their children without having that fear. Because as soon as that little um, bump in the road, so to speak, like whether it's money, uh, whether it's finances or a car or work or whatever, they, the pro-life movement will remove that boulder from that mom's way. And then once they do that, the mom is free to be able to choose life because that, that is no longer on her shoulders to carry. Um, and so nine out of 10 times when a mom has that boulder removed, she wants to keep the child once, you know. So it's very interesting to see where we are willing to help the mother and the child, but the pro-choice side of it literally just wants women to kill their babies. And I think that's more prominent now than ever with the news we see every day. There are pro-choicers who stain their pants blood red and yeah. carry around baby dolls and interrupt church services and what it's just it's it's crazy <laughs> yeah yeah there's like something going on with those people I, you know because i think like you know the the view that they have of like pro-life people um it's it's like a cartoon villain they think that like we're all just about you know the baby being born then we just kind of disappear i've seen this meme constantly from my pro-choice friends and i know sometimes it can be kind of really disheartening but i mean with the work that you've done i mean you've obviously seen firsthand the good that the pro-life movement can do. Um, so, you know, you talked about how people say that you, you're, you know, you're anti-woman or something like that. <laughs> have you had like, you know, friends who, I don't know, friends who maybe like, you know, guys and girls who are both like, what, you're pro-life? Like, 
why? Like, you know, they're kind of just confused or have you not had that from your like friends? Is it more like people online? Yeah, I definitely had it back when I was like just kind of coming into my faith a little bit, but I was more political at that point than I was really Catholic. And so my political standpoint was like, obviously like pro-choice is bad. Um, so I had some liberal friends who were a little confused about it. They weren't necessarily like aggressive in any way, like mm -hmm. trying to like start a fight or anything. They were just like, what? Like, you've never posted about this before. Why is this all of a sudden a thing with you? Um, but those were friends that I never really saw because they moved away. So it didn't really create much tension at all. Um, and then when it did, they kind of just like unfollowed me or unfriended me and we just kind of drifted apart naturally. Most of the hate I get is honestly from uh, strangers and most of it actually comes from men, believe it or not. Wow. Not from women. Hmm. I've only gotten maybe like a handful of hate. I mean, obviously over the last two years, it's been more than a handful, a giant handful <laughs> of mm -hmm. um, women hate comments about being pro-life compared to like the mountain size amount of insults I get from men pro-choicers, male pro-choicers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't want to psychologize into that, but that's kind of, there's right, a lot of, right. there's a lot that's sus, if you know what I mean. So yeah. um, last question. So the Latin mass, right? Obviously something that you really love and care about. And honestly, I can say too, like, you know, I've gone to a Latin mass multiple times in my life, really enjoyed it myself. Um, but obviously it's not about me, right? I love how mm -hmm with with the latin mass it's really about the eucharist right and everyone kind of goes in the for in the background to christ and right. especially the priest who is serving you know in the person of christ to us or, right. or actually well as the mediator between us and god so i wanted to ask you um what does the latin mass mean to you and i know that's kind of like a softball question it's like everybody i'm sure everybody asks you that right but like i, I just want to hear you know from someone who is you know, adores and loves Latin mass. What, what's that like for you? Yeah, I think the main thing, especially is that it's the mass that the saints were mm -hmm. constantly going to. St. Padre Pio said the Latin mass. St. Tres of Lisieux went to mass, the Latin mass. Um, St. Catherine of Siena went to the Latin mass, like just St. John Vianney. So many amazing saints went to the traditional Latin mass because that was the only mass at that time. And it was the universal language. Nowadays, people will say Latin. Nobody knows Latin anymore. And in reality, if we only kept the Latin mass, I'm not saying Vatican II is invalid. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying, <laughs> if we only kept the Latin mass until now, it still be the universal language of the church. And it still is the universal language of the church when you go to other countries and things of that nature. However, it is so disheartening to see so many people try and get rid of it, mm -hmm. especially when we were completely fine for, and it's been fine for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and I'm always thinking to myself, I'm just like, I'm not saying you know, Novus Ordo is invalid, but I am saying there are definitely a lot of liturgical abuses that happen in the Novus Ordo, and I've witnessed many of them. And um, as a Catholic, seeing that really disheartened me, and seeing how much disrespect certain people have for the Eucharist, um, no wonder, you know, 70% of Catholics don't believe in the true presence anymore. Mm. So when it comes to the traditional Latin Mass, the reverence, the dress code, everybody tends to just take it more seriously because that is the environment that they're in. The church has beautiful architecture. The music is Gregorian chant, no guitars, no drums. You know, it's very solemn. It's very holy. And because people feel that when they walk in, there is conviction about what they wear and how they speak during mass and things. When I go to a Novus Ordo parish, I go to a very beautiful Novus Ordo parish mm -hmm. and a very reverent one as well. But when I go to a different Novus Ordo parish, there are people talking so loudly during mass. Mm. And I mean, I'm fine with babies crying, babies crying, I don't care. But these are like older people who are like saying like hi to each other during the Eucharistic consecration. Like it drives me crazy. And I'm just like, do you have no respect and no reverence for who you are literally, the miracle that you yeah. are literally about to witness? Um, and in the Latin mass, you really don't get that. You know, you, mm -hmm. you know why you're there. You know who you're in front of because 
the priest, the head of that church knows who he is, you know, in front of. And so I guess just in general, the reverence and the beauty of it um, is just one of those things that is lacking in today's world and that my generation is really crying out for. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have sympathy for people who might say like, oh, but you know, the Latin mass is super intense, right? Or, you know, like, (laughs) I mean, because it is, it is intense. Um, I mean, do you have any advice for people who, you know, want to bring their friends to Latin mass or people who are like, I kind of want to go, but I'm not sure, you know, like, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I definitely have a lot of sympathy because I went to my first (laughs) Polish mass Mm -hmm. a couple months ago and I was so confused. I'm like, what are they saying? And I knew the mass well enough, the rubrics to be able to follow along in like English and Latin and Polish. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew a little Polish, but um, it was so confusing to me. I'm like, wow, I have way more respect for people who go to the Latin mass for their first time um, because that's probably what it's like for them. (laughs) So I would suggest if you are a first time TLM goer to definitely get a missile. This is, um, or a red book. I, I always say you can get them off Amazon. I don't like Amazon, but you might even find them at a local Catholic store if you can find one or tan books has them and it's a little red fam- pamphlet you know little red pamphlet and in it it has the Latin to English translation and it has pictures on it too so you can follow along with where they're at in the mass I also highly suggest sitting a little bit in the back or the middle of the church so then you can follow along with everybody else's doing um that way hopefully you you know don't feel as lost (laughs) because I know a lot of people want to sit up front the first couple of times and I'm like that's totally fine if you want to but just know you might be looking behind you a lot to see what people are doing (laughs) Mm -hmm. because you'll hear the the pews start to creak and you'll be standing and everyone else is like sitting um because ask me how I know um (laughs) and if you want to take your friends with honestly I think I did this with a lot of my Protestant friends I didn't give them a missile I didn't give them any kind of reference I just let them sit there and like experience it. And because they had me next to them, they could see, oh, okay, we're sitting now or okay, we're standing now. And so I would actually bring them up to the front um, Mm -hmm. so that they could see it like in HD, clear vision 2020, um, what was actually happening. And they just thought it was the most beautiful thing. They were like, I don't know what the heck he's saying, but this is beautiful. And actually three of those friends ended up converting. So it's just amazing. Like, sometimes you don't need words to show how beautiful something is, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes they can understand it in their soul because that's how God speaks to us. Um, And so honestly, you don't really need to do a lot as long as like, you know what you're doing and you can bring somebody along to experience it. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yep. And also get ready for all the kids who'll be like looking at Mm -hmm. you and and kind of moving around a little bit in the pews. I love it. (laughs) I was at a, what was it? Um, Good Friday service because we don't have mass on Good Friday. They do the stripping of the altar. Yeah. And there were these, it was like a three hour long service. And these little boys, two little boys, they're the cutest things. I always sit next to them when I can because I always see other people get really impatient with them and like get up and move. I choose to sit next to them because I love kids and I want the parents to know that they're doing a good job and like their kids are nothing to be ashamed of no matter Mm -hmm. how crazy they are. And, uh, well, they crawled over me a couple of times, you know, used my leg as like a race car for one of their race car track and, you know, and stuff. But it, it's interesting to see how kids perceive things because they would do that during the homily. But then when mass would start again, it's like they just instantly knew like, oh, that's Jesus. And they wanted to see. So I would mm. sometimes lift them up, put them on my shoulders and they could like see. And it's just really cool to see how it affects kids. Yeah. Amber, that's beautiful. So where can we find uh, your content? You know, so I I mentioned Instagram, I think you said Twitter, where else? Yep, I have a YouTube channel, The Religious Hippie on everything. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and then of course my podcast. And you guys can also find all of that on my official website at thereligioushippie.com. And that's H-I-P-P-I-E.com. Yep, and I'll have all those links in the description. But Amber, thank you so much for just, you know, your graciousness and all of this and taking the time out of your day. Of course. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.